so I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about how this uh, session came about. It's, it's a bit different from what we've done in the past. Um, we really, in the past, we've really focused on uh, disease and how to uh, better care for our patients, but we decided, uh, actually Michelle and I decided uh, to make this part of our uh, session today. Uh, after talking with several uh, nurses and advanced practice nurses at our reception uh, last December and, and really realizing that uh, people are not working to, the, to their full scope of practice and f feeling very frustrated because they aren't, but they don't know what to do about it. And so we, we came up with this uh, with the hope that we can help you all uh, better navigate your role. And if you're not doing what you want to be doing, then how can we maybe after uh, today help you get there? So what I thought I would do is just sort of start off um, with uh, talking about uh, this sort of in general and then specifically about my role and the role of others who uh, I've talked to, uh, number one. And then uh, when we're done, what we'll do is actually have the panelists describe uh, their roles as well. I have no disclosures. And these are the objectives. Um, what I want to mention here is that when I started thinking about this talk, um, I had an idea of how it was going to be put together. And then after I reviewed the literature, I completely changed how I was going to put this talk together, um, partly because there's such a paucity of data on this, um, and I'll refer to that as we go through um, this session. But I can't tell you uh, what you need to um, do in your practice. You're in a different state than I am. You have a different role. Some of you are nurses, some of you are nurse practitioners. Um, and so what I realized as I was going through it is we can provide you with information, but we can't tell you what you should or shouldn't be doing based on your particular situation. So we'll talk generally about uh, role and scope of practice, and then when we break down into individual groups, we'll talk more specifically about that. And then talk about what are benchmark standards needed in quality IBD care, and then what I'm going to do is uh, talk about uh, some of the quality improvement projects uh, that I have done over the past year and how you might be able to incorporate quality improvement in uh, your role. And, and, and if I think back over, I've been a nurse practitioner for 19 years and, it, and it's hard for me to believe sometimes um, that it's been that length of time, but I think what I've noticed the most in those 19 years and, and they've all been in pediatric gastroenterology, they all, they've all been you know, in a specialty area. What I think that I've noticed the most, and, and this has probably been more over the past 10 years or so, is that nurses and nurse practitioners need to do more than just take care of the patients. That's becoming an expectation, and that's gonna become more and more of an expectation as we uh, move forward. So just thinking about models of care in IBD, this was an excellent article in the Jour Journal of Crohn's and Colitis that did an international survey of IBD health professionals. And it was looking at how to improve models of care in IBD. And you know, the interesting part of it was that number one, an integrated approach is better. And number two is it's better when nurses are doing nursing jobs and not administrative tasks. And can we, can any of us in this group say that we do nursing or advanced practice nurse jobs 100% of the time? No, you know, that's just never, never, never gonna happen. But on the other hand, 
it, it should be a small part of our job, right, if things are working the way they should. So that was a really significant finding from this study. The other uh, significant finding was that teams often don't include uh, mental health practitioners, and so uh, psychosocial screening is done, but often done informally. And what, if I've learned nothing else uh, over the past couple of years uh, with the study that I did with our patients is that informal psychosocial screening isn't going to cut it, right? We need to do some sort of formal screening. So that was an important piece of information. And then uh, many centers either use a combination of the biomedical approach and the biopsychosocial approach or strictly the biomedical approach, which doesn't take into account psychosocial care, which nurses are so good at. And so that's an important uh, take-home message from, from this. And then lastly, as we all know, there's lots of barriers. There's barriers in terms of funding. There's barriers in terms of the system. There's barriers in terms of politics. It's always time and money. And then we don't have um, often enough administrative support because when things get cut, that often gets cut. And do we not? And, and we often have a lack of qualified IBD staff. So. Um, Another uh, article that was uh, very helpful, and, and interestingly enough, for those of you who are from outside the uni United States, a lot of the literature was not from the United States. It was from other countries. And this was actually from the Canadian Journal of uh, Gastroenterology. And the point of the article was, how do we change outcomes? And the problem is there's not much data on how nurses influence uh, health outcomes. Um, things that we can do, and again, these were evidenced in some of the uh, abstracts that were submitted. Uh, we can measure uh, admission rates, we can measure ED visits, we can measure surgical rates complication, medication adherence, patient quality of life. We can measure all those, but we don't have a lot of nursing data on those kinds of things. How can we improve? We already talked about uh, telephone helplines. Um, what can nurses do in terms of administering uh, biologics? Uh, there are uh, completely nurse-run uh, biologic clinics uh, that, are, that are out there. Can nurses be involved in rapid access clinics, which is kind of a step up from the uh, telephone uh, triage? And then uh, transitional clinics. We've been talking about transitional clinics for years and years and years, and we still don't have uh, in a lot of centers the kind of transitional uh, clinics from pediatric to adult care that we would like. Hopefully, nurse-run clinics can uh, decrease wait time, decrease time to diagnosis, and decrease time to start of therapy. So what I did was informally poll uh, some people to try to get information on what they're doing and what they would like to be doing because I know from talking to people at other centers that our center is, is different from other centers, but also in some respects the same. Some of the issues that our nurses face are uh, the same as uh, what is faced at other centers. Our others are different depending upon funding, depending upon uh, patient population. And, and I'm at UNC, which is a large uh, center, and we have uh, multiple uh, IBD providers. I'm the only nurse practitioner that takes care of IBD patients. Um, our, we have three nurses, and one of them would like to do exclusively IBD, but she does, she does a lot of the uh, IBD care, but we really split it between all three nurses because if that nurse is off, then there's nobody to, to take care of it. So um, what I asked her, I said, give me five minutes of your time, and I want to know, you know what you're spending too much of your time on 
and what you would like to be doing. And, and so I sort of set it up on, as what, you, what you're doing and what you would like to be doing. And, and obviously we know she's uh, taking a ton of parent phone calls. And that's not something she doesn't want to be doing. That's just a huge part of her job. But, but what I've seen her and our other nurses doing more and more lately is prior authorization for the various biologics and then authorization for studies done outside the hospital. And interestingly enough, when we, when we all got together as a group yesterday uh, to talk about today, I found out that other centers have people that do that so that nursing doesn't have to do that. And, and that's great for them, but it's not so great for us. Um, another thing she spends a lot of time on is things like uh, the 504 uh, plan letters to uh, schools uh, and other kinds of letters, not just 504 plan letters, but lots of lots and lots of letters. And then also injection teaching. So again, those things are not all things she doesn't want to be doing, but certainly the authorization part of it she really would love to uh, get rid of. And then when I asked her what she would like to do, and, and by the way, this five minute conversation turned into a, at least a 20 minute conversation because she had she just started firing off all the things that she wanted to be doing that she couldn't do. And, and really, what we, we're, we're part of our ICN, Improved Care Now, uh, our organization is, and, and what, we, um, what we do is we track follow-up visits so that anybody who's not had a follow-up visit in six months uh, would get a phone call, and then if they don't respond to the phone call, then they, then they get a letter. We have a whole system for that. And so sometimes those patients fall through the cracks because we just can't keep following, 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 and calling, calling, calling. So she'd like to do more of that. She'd like to keep track better of the annual screenings that we do and the immunizations. Uh, she would like to do more teaching about all aspects of IBD, and then she also would like to have uh, more involvement in transition of care. And, you know, we have uh, some providers who do that better than others, um, but we have some that really still struggle with it and, and, and don't do the kind of job that they, they, that they should do for uh, transition of care. So then, um, uh, one of our uh, former nurse practitioners has uh, relocated to a different large uh, pediatric center, which I will not name uh, this morning, uh, but she started talking to me about how her role has changed uh, since she left UNC, and uh, so I actually interviewed one of the uh, one of her fellow uh, nurse practitioners up there who uh, does uh, strictly. IBD, and uh, she sees clinic patients 50% of the time, and then the other 50% of the time she does program development, inpatient and outpatient uh, education, and then interestingly enough, uh, I thought, she does provider education on uh, dosing side effects, all those kinds of things with the new biologics. Uh, and then lastly, she does what our nurses do is um, injection teaching. And she only had one thing she would like to do differently, but it's huge it's see patients more independently. And so when she sees patients, she usually sees that patient with a physician. Uh, some of the physicians will let her go in and, and do the visits by herself. Um, uh, some physicians want to be with her every single time she sees a patient, and then some physicians will go in with her if a patient is having a problem. So that's her biggest goal, is that she would like to do that. So you can see there's quite a disparity in what she's doing and what she would really like to be doing. And, and I suspect in some of your cases, particularly some of you who are newer at either your nurse role or your nurse practitioner role may feel the same way. So I'm gonna go back to the dark ages and tell you how I started 19 years ago. Uh, I was the only nurse practitioner in the Children's Center at UNC who was not in the NICU. So they didn't really know what to do with me. They didn't know what to call me. They kept calling me a PA, even though I was a nurse practitioner. They had no idea what to do with me. And so when I initially started out, I was allowed to run a uh, one-day-a-week um, constipation clinic. And <laughs> that's all I could do. And, and that was okay in the beginning because I didn't have any experience and, and I, um, 
you know, it helped me get my feet wet. And then they said I could do, take care of patients that had reflux and constipation. And then I started taking care of abdominal pain patients. And, and my, um, my uh, rate of uh, how, how I developed into the role was very, very slow because that first clinic was five hours a week. And so I didn't really, it, it took me a long time to learn the world of GI because it was such a part-time situation. And I had a primary care physician at the time, and so I was flip-flopping back and forth. Well, what, what happened over time is I kept getting more and more responsibility, and, and, and several years in, probably about three or four years in, I started taking care of any kind of patient that had GI problems. And, and that's really when I found out that, that the, patient, uh, the pediatric IBD patients were actually my favorite uh, cohort of patients to take care of. And so fast forwarding, you know, 19 years later, I have a practice that you notice I don't have two sides to my side uh, on myself because I feel like I'm doing everything that I want to do. I don't have a perfect situation, but there's not a lot that I want to do that I'm not able to do in my current situation. And my, my situation is 75% clinical, 25% academic. So I teach at the School of Nursing. I teach graduate students at the School of Nursing 25% of the time. And so I see general GI patients. I see uh, a lot of IBD patients, but I see pretty much everything. I don't see very many liver uh, patients, but uh, I see, see clinic patients three days a week. And then I have one day of administrative time, which is partly administration of patients and then partly uh, a little bit of time in uh, administering uh, administrative role over the NPs and uh, nurses in our division. And so I do everything that has to do with patient care, but since we are part of Improved Care Now, we have weekly meetings uh, where we go over all our patients um, with IBD and we don't do it that every single week, but we go, we have a set system where each week we talk about different things. In addition to that, we've developed a parent group uh, that we um, work very, very closely with. Uh, and so what we've done through them is, is we have two parents who, is, who attend our weekly meetings, and then we have quarterly meetings with a larger uh, parent group. And through that, we've implemented quarterly parent educational uh, uh, sessions, et cetera. So we've done a whole lot with that. And then, and then lastly, the thing that's changed probably more in the past um, few years, and, and it kind of goes along with what I said early on, is involvement in QI projects. And that's where I really think my role has changed a lot because that's become an expectation for me. Now, now the problem is if you don't have uh, support, if you don't have administrative support, it's really hard to do more than what's directly re related to seeing those patients every single day, whether you're a nurse or a nurse practitioner. There's just not time in the week, right? And so that part of it is difficult uh, without uh, support. And, and in my case, I'm very, very fortunate. Um, I have uh, a uh, new chief as of two years ago, and he's very much for that, and that's how I've been able to change my role. And so most recently, uh, the way that my role will change, and this is after the first of the year, once I have time to get my act together and present this, is that I will um, actually run uh, a weekly health maintenance clinic for our patients with IBD. So we have roughly 300 patients with IBD, and I have about 50 of my own, but I will be overseeing health maintenance for all of those patients. So, so there's not really a whole lot that I would want to be doing that, that I'm not already doing, which, which is pretty exciting considering where I started from taking care of constipated patients. And, and that's not to say that constipation constipated patients aren't important, but I've come a long way, I feel like, since uh, 19 years ago when people didn't even understand anything about the role. So what I thought I would do is just talk about a couple of um, uh, QI projects. Um, if you are somebody who is interested in, in QI and you don't know how to get started or uh, you don't know whether you have time for it, this might be helpful for you. And, and the first uh, QI project is actually a small one. Um, and we started this probably a year or so ago. And, and we actually worked on it uh, over the course of the spring. 
And so what we did was uh, with our uh, parents, uh, with our key parents that are part of our group as we developed a uh, survey to give to parents uh, looking at all aspects of care and what they thought we did well and what they thought that we didn't do uh, so well and that ranged from how did you feel when you were diagnosed and starting treatment how did you feel like that was communicated uh, with you all the way down to when your child's getting infusions how how do, does the staff treat you what is the environment like um, and are you feeling what you feeling like you get what you need for education uh, transition of care etc and so it, it was really interesting because we didn't know how it was going to turn out and um, we actually pilot tested it with four families uh, that were in our parent group and made a few changes. And then we administered it to patients sort of across the board with um, several of the providers. And it was a small study. We, we only had uh, 20 in our, our study, but we kept going until we didn't get any more uh, new information. And, and you might say, how do I have time to, to do this? Well, actually, we had the parent uh, put together questions and then we all went through it, all the providers went through it and we made changes and then we actually had a medical student helping us who uh, administered uh, the uh, questionnaire to the patients and so that's how we got it done uh, without having to uh, actually do the administration ourselves. And, and you know, when we, when we got the results, the results were very positive, but we knew that there were things that we could uh, do better. And, and one of the things that, that we give everybody w um, is a welcome packet. And we had worked really hard on that welcome packet, making sure we had everything in that packet that we, that we thought patients needed. But there were a few things that came out of that survey that made us realize we needed to go back and revisit that packet that was a year or two old and, and update it with contact information because people still were not clear on how to get a hold of us because there's multiple ways to do so in this day and age, right? Uh, they felt like in some cases we weren't including the pediatric patient in discussion as much as we should. Uh, in a, it, we have two areas of infusion and one was not as private as the other. Uh, it, it, they didn't say that we needed to work on transition, but they had no concerns about transition and so that was a concern to us because we knew that we could do better in that. And we were providing these um, these patient education programs quarterly in Chapel Hill where we're located, but we have some patients who come from two and three hours away, which I'm sure you all do too, all over the state. And that's pretty hard for people to do at six o'clock on a Tuesday evening. So we got some good information and we made some positive changes as a result of that. So, so that was actually something that didn't take a lot of time and, and was a, an example of a small uh, study that, uh, uh, a small QI project that we did. Um, this, this study was actually um, a much larger uh, project and um, it, it was something that I started actually a year and a half ago and you might say, gosh, what in the heck is it taking you a year and a half uh, on one project? But it kept growing and growing and growing and growing and so it certainly, sort of, it's sort of become my baby that I think is never gonna grow up, but I know we've moved forward with it and, and have had really, really good uh, outcome uh, thus far. And so what we wanted to do in our center was to administer uh, rapid infusions, and we had no protocol in place on how to do that. And so what we decided to do before we start administering rapid infusions, which I know probably many of you are already doing, in pediatrics we tend to drag our feet and not do things as quickly as the adult world. Uh, but what we, what we knew we had to do is we need to have some sort of protocol in place to uh, be able to do that. And then we also knew that we needed to better standardize the care in both of our uh, units that administer uh, infliximab. And so what we really wanted to look at was specific parts of what we do and how we could make that better. So we looked at labs because some providers would order these labs standard and never deviate 
and then others would just throw in random labs that we didn't necessarily need. And then some key labs were left out, like albumin. So we really wanted to standardize that. We really wanted to look at pre-meds and decide whether every patient needed pre-meds because that's how we were doing it. We wanted to standardize vital signs because some nurses didn't take a full set of vital signs, some did. Um, and so we, we felt like that was important. And we had a pre-screen questionnaire that we also administered and um, that needed some tweaking, uh, number one. And number two, it also um, wasn't done 100% of the time. And so it sort of disappeared after the, after the visit and, and we didn't gain much information from it. And then next we wanted to be able to manage infusion reactions should they occur uh, because we didn't have a standardized practice. I mean, we knew when to give epi and not to give epi, which was certainly the most critical part of it, but we didn't, um, we didn't have a standard uh, procedure for that. So what we did was we actually uh, made up two parts. One was what we called the standard operating procedure and the other was management of reactions. And the standard operating procedure looked at all those things that I just talked about and then the management of reactions was strictly related to how to manage reactions. And so this is just, this is not the actual pre-screening uh, infliximab questionnaire, but it's sort of what I put on the slide, and, and I know it's hard to read, so if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, but, it, but it really is divided into two parts, and the first part looks at, has the child been sick recently? The second part looks at uh, IBD symptoms, and then the third part looks at infusion reactions, and there's a couple little questions at the bottom that are related to, to uh, none of those. Are they have they any concerns today? Is there anything new or different? And so, for those of you who are familiar with uh, QI, uh, PDSA cycles are a huge part of it, plan, do, study, and act. And so what you're doing is you're constantly planning, doing, studying what you did, and then making changes based on that. Well, we did sort of the plan do over and over and over and over again with multiple parties that we needed buy-in from. And so we would get feedback and we'd revise our plan. So this actually took many months. Um, and when I say us, um, I was working with one of our uh, pediatric uh, gastroenterologists who specializes in IBD. And so then you also may be familiar with key driver diagrams. And again, there's a lot of information on this slide, but I think the main thing is, was that we wanted to improve and standardize our infliximab uh, infusions. And the things that were gonna, one of the key things that was gonna help that was effective communication and adherence to this new uh, operating procedure. So, key challenges, you know, we had to start with a lit review and there was not a lot of information in the literature and actually uh, more significant information was 10, 12 or more year, years old from the early days of infliximab. We polled other centers that were in ICN, um, other pediatric centers, and we, we got a little bit of information but we really didn't have what we needed to, to put our program together. And then we had lots and lots of people that had to give their approval. And that, that part of it, bullet number three, probably took two to three months in itself. And then we needed to disseminate all the information to our nurses who were administering the infusions. And so I did two in-services for the nurses. And, and, and again, what I realized is that not, we had this very uh, large disparity in what nurses understood about even what IBD is. Uh, and some were new and some were old and some had learned some on their own. Some didn't understand completely how infliximab works, side effects, et cetera. So we went through all of that. And uh, they really took it upon themselves to take that a step further and, and learn. So that was a really good thing. So what we learned from this, um, and again, this, this is still an ongoing uh, project. We learned that uh, we had to do this. It's essential for QI. We know that, and, and we tried to teach our nurses that you know, their clinical uh, judgment is still essential. It's not like we're taking that judgment away from them. There's still uh, decisions that they have to make on their own. But I think the, the key thing that came out of this is that the, the uh, implementation of the standard operating protocol uh, 
has had many very positive changes uh, in terms of improved communication. So those nurses are actively utilizing that questionnaire, which I don't think they did before, and we're tracking how they're using that. And, and, and our tracking rate is, is probably about 95%. And once they're gain, getting that information, they're contacting us, and they're saying, this patient is on antibiotic day such and such for such and such, such and such, and we, you know, we need to know if you want to go ahead with the infusion, or this patient had this draining um, uh, area, and do you need to come look at this patient? Because we don't see the patients every time they come for an infusion, we usually see them every other time. So that was a huge, huge change in practice uh, that's hard to measure. Uh, but we, we know it ourselves, and the nurses feel that as well. So where do we want to go? Again, you know, the, the, the parent survey is something that we'll probably reinitiate at some point in time, but that had more of an endpoint. This, this one really has, uh, you know, we, we haven't gotten to the point of actually uh, administering rapid infusions, which was the, the whole goal in, in the beginning. But if you're thinking about a QI project, you have to remember that once you're done with it, and I think some of the physicians have had kind of a hard time, now that we've done it, we're done. We don't have to do anything else, but really we're in the evaluation stage right now. So we're doing a six-month evaluation of how do parents feel about it. Uh, and again, that's hard because I don't know that they noticed some of the things that went on before, but really looking more at nurse and provider satisfaction in a qualitative uh, from a qualitative standpoint, and then quantitatively, are we, you know, when we're looking at this, are these questionnaires getting done? Are we doing standard labs and not these extraneous labs that don't need to be done or miss, uh, missing labs that do need to be done? We're using it for um, betalizumab um, as well now, and we will continue, continue to update it periodically as needed. So just a little bit of food for thought uh, before we move to uh, the round table. I think that what I would say to you is as you're having this, these discussions uh, this morning, um, think about what is your role, what are you doing, what would you like to be doing, how can you change that? And, and the system will prevent you from possibly being, doing, being able to do everything uh, that, uh, that you would want to do, but how can we, as nurses or advanced practice providers, who are directly responsible for patient care, we are the ones who are with the patients the most, we are the ones who are directly providing the most care, we should be central to doing some of these activities that improve patient outcomes, and how can we do it? I, I think one of the barriers to, to it is uh, lack of education. Oftentimes we're not prepared well enough to be able to do these kinds of things, but I think what I'm seeing in academic programs, not only at the undergraduate level now, but at the graduate level, more emphasis on things like QI and research and how those things improve patient outcomes. For those of us who have been around a lot longer, we have to kind of learn that um, on our own. And one of the um, uh, things that you can um, look at, if you haven't already, is the uh, Institute for Healthcare uh, Improvement, uh, the IHI, and that actually has um, tools to help you uh, lead QI efforts if you're so interested in doing so.